You know, when I started this series on Xenogears, I originally planned on making it three videos long. You know, just kind of seemed like a good number for this kind of format. But when I sat down and started writing, I began to realize that there is a lot more stuff that goes on in this game than I could have ever guessed. Think about it. Over the course of this game, we've destroyed a village, liberated a nation, gone to prison, explored the bottom of the ocean, watched the culling of an entire religion, entered a UFO, won a martial arts tournament, won a mecha martial arts tournament, gone through two submarines, saved a nation from nuclear annihilation, and even eaten man meats. The more I poured over the first disc, the more I found I just couldn't really cut out as much as I wanted from the summary. And it is a credit to this game that it managed to keep all of that stuff coherent. One of the things I love most about Xenogears is just how much exciting stuff you get to do in it. How much happens from beginning to end. Well, unfortunately, all of that is about to change because we are about to enter the second disc of Xenogears. So, for those who don't know, or who never finished the game, Xenogears Disc 2 is where the developers essentially ran out of money. They still had a good third of the game left to finish, a ton of unanswered questions left to answer, and... Well, they had nowhere near enough budget to make those things a reality. So, what is a game developer to do? I mean, they do have a few options in a situation like this, but none of them are good. Well, in Xenogear's case, they opted for cutting corners. And I'm talking big, sweeping cuts, like they started out with a big rectangular piece of construction paper and ended up with one tiny little circle. So, what exactly does this mean? You ever heard that old storytelling mantra, show, don't tell? Well, Xenogears decided to do the opposite of that. The second disc in its entirety is comprised of a decent number of cutscenes, a handful of boss fights, I think three or four dungeons total, one open world section at the very end, and that is it. Everything else is text boxes. Long, explainy text boxes set in front of a static or mostly static image that just tells you what happens. Once arriving at the central control room, we met up with Sitan, who helped us activate the mass driver. We succeeded in launching the capsule and blah 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 blah. As such, we do get the full story, or at least the framework of the full story. However, we lose out on a lot of things along the way, like, you know, character interaction or any sort of immersion you might have had in the game. So with that in mind, I figured we could go about things a little differently this time. Rather than spend the majority of the time focusing on the summary of events as they played out, the focus of this video will be a little different. We still will have the summary, of course, but it'll be quick and to the point, because quite frankly, a lot of it is either just watching boss fights or reading a very short text box. Instead, we shall be answering the lingering questions still hanging in the air. Every once in a while, at important points, I'm going to just stop the summary and answer questions. You know, walk you through the logic of this game, at least as far as I see it. In any event, hopefully by the end of all of this, the whole story will make at least some kind of sense. Hopefully. Like, there's a lot to answer, and there's definitely a few sections that even I'm a little iffy on, but I will try my best. So, without further ado, let us finish off Xenogears. And before I begin, just to end this intro off on a higher note, it is worth noting that, despite this disc containing a lot of disappointments due to budget issues, there are still some truly amazing moments that make it worth seeing this game to the end. So, I hope you'll stick through it with me. Okay, so before we start, there's still like technically 20 minutes or so of the first disc left off that I still need to explain. So we ended last time with Ed and Ellie KOing each other in a big dramatic moment, which resulted in the Igrizel retreating back to Shabbat, where Sitan explained to everyone that Faye is actually three kids in a trench coat trying to sneak into an R-rated movie. Anyways, the Council of Elders in Shabbat, including the Queen, decide that, well, if Ed really is a part of Faye, then it is too dangerous to just let him traipse about. Like like he has been so far. So they opt to freeze him in carbonite, Han Solo style. 
And surprisingly, everyone, except for Ellie, seems to agree with this, including Faye. But eventually, Ellie manages to convince Faye to run away with her and go to a place where no conflict exists. After all, if Faye is never put into a moment of distress, then it will never have an opportunity to awaken. And of course, some of your other friends show up to help out as well. So together, alone, Faye and Ellie set off to try and find a place to hide and just live a quiet and peaceful life. But of course, we know that that plan is doomed to fail, because for whatever reason, Graf and Krellian and Ramses and every other major villain in this is obsessed with the both of them. So they are obviously going to be looking for them. And sure enough, they haven't flown far from Shavat before they are caught by Ramses, who is flying his own shiny new Omni gear, and is under the orders of Krellian to retrieve Ellie unharmed. But Ramses, being Ramses, is only interested in checking off his fuck Mary kill list, in which he has Faye listed as all three options. So, despite being ordered to capture Ellie unharmed, he proceeds to send the Welltall hurtling out of the sky in a flaming pile of wreckage. And so ends the first disc, a big cliffhanger on whether or not Faye and Ellie are okay. So, it seems like as good a time as any to answer our first question of the day. So, over the course of the first disc, many, many times, Faye and Ellie both have had these moments where they, like, recognize someone that they've never met before, or do something that they shouldn't be able to do. You know, like when Faye felt like he knew Krellian, or when Ellie booted up that computer in Zebuim. Well, the short answer for why this happens is past lives. So, in the second disc, we learn that reincarnation is totally a thing at least as far as Faye and Ellie are concerned. Basically, they have past lives, and while they don't necessarily remember them, a piece of them exists somewhere within them. And there have been a number of them, although for some reason Ellie has always been called Elahayim, while Faye has had any number of different names. In any event, there are three important past lives of Faye and Ellie that matter in regards to the story here. The first one was around 10,000 years ago, when Faye was known as Abel. And we'll talk more about that one later. For now, just know that it exists. The second was around 4,000 years ago, when Faye was known as Kim. And well, if you recall, that is what Emerelda called Faye. At this point in time, humanity is highly advanced. Years, advances in technology and medicine, you name it, they're a super society. And Kim was a researcher in this time, particularly looking into the study of nanomachines. And well, along with the help of his wife Ellie, he created an artificial life form, who was, of course, Emerelda. However, someone took notice of the potential of this artificial life form and sought to take it for themselves. So, Kim and Ellie, backs against the wall, made the ultimate sacrifice to save their child. Ellie was gunned down by troops seeking to abduct Emerelda, while Faye sealed himself with Emerelda in a chamber that couldn't be reached. And there, he died alone, leaving Emerelda suspended in stasis until we finally found her 4,000 years later. But, by far the most important past life that we have to talk about is one that happened about uh, 500 years ago. At this time, while Ellie again was still named Ellie, she also had a title, the Holy Mother Sophia. And if you remember way back to the first video, which again, I don't blame you if you don't, the name of the person who founded Margie's religion was the Holy Mother Sophia. And what's more, the picture of her looked shockingly like Ellie. Well, that's because Sophia was indeed one of Ellie's past lives. In any event, at this time, Solaris and Shabbat were locked in a full-on war. And Nissan, a, along with most of the surface-dwelling nations, were allied with Shabbat in that war. Because, you know, Solaris. They're evil. They eat people. Anyways, Sophia herself wasn't technically a political figure, she was just the head of a church, but because her religion took in so many refugees from the war, she ended up becoming the symbol of the surface dwellers, the face of the resistance against the tyrannical Solaris. As such, she ended up being far more important of a figure in the war than she would have ever expected, or liked for that matter. Still, she understood the weight of the responsibilities being thrust upon her, and decided to act upon them to the best of her abilities. And by her side, she did have a number of friends to help her out, all part of the war effort. There were a pair of brothers named Ronnie and Rene, who were two of Bart's ancestors, there was the Queen of Shabbat, there was her right-hand man Krellian, and finally there was a man named 
Lacan. Lacan was just a member of the anti-Solaris movement. He just so happened to be friends with Ronnie and Rene, and as such ended up rubbing elbows with a number of people that were a fair bit about his station. Still, he got along well with everyone around him, and eventually it came to light that he was actually a pretty damn good painter. So, Krellian requested of him a painting of the Holy Mother Sophia, a grand artwork to capture her majestic image and share it with all the people fighting under her light. Lacan agreed, and so he and Sophia got to spend a large amount of time alone together. And slowly, over time, they began to realize how much they enjoyed their time together. Lacan began to become enamored with her caring and kind-hearted nature, while Sophia enjoyed being able to be herself, to drop the Holy Mother mantle, and just be regular old Ellie. So it was only natural that their feelings for one another began to blossom. However, the two of them had trouble expressing it. Lacan, not believing himself suitable for the Holy Mother Sophia, instead opted for more juvenile tactics. The closer the painting came to completion, the more he would throw up excuses for why he couldn't finish it, saying things like he wasn't in the right state of mind, or he didn't have the right paint, just anything to prolong the process and keep giving him a reason to see her. And this went on for a fair while, but eventually, he stopped needing a reason to delay. Because ultimately, the painting never was finished, because the war between Solaris and Shabbat would come to an end with Sophia sacrificing herself. Alright, well, that's enough of that for now. Let's get back to the summary, shall we? So, Faye and Ellie, after dreaming about their past lives, awaken to find themselves in these healing pod thingies, which are being manned by this Yoda-looking guy who's kind of important, but also not really. He just, like, knows a bunch of stuff, but doesn't really do anything. Anyways, it turns out that this old guy knows Sitan, because of course he does. Who the fuck doesn't know Sitan personally? And he called Sitan over to come and pick you up once you awoke. Anyways, after a brief reunion, and Faye and Ellie thank you their lucky stars that they're still alive after that crash, Sitan and the old man very quickly tell you that they've come up with a way to use an ancient cannon called a mass driver to spread a bunch of nanomachines over the earth. These nanomachines would be specially designed to remove the limiters that had been placed on every human being by Solaris and finally free the surface dwellers from the Gazelle Ministry's tyrannical control. But before he can do that, an emissary from Shabbat shows up and claims that Shabbat is under attack from Solaris and they desperately need aid. Specifically, they want Faye because he's such a good pilot. Faye is hesitant to help, after all, Solaris did try to freeze him in carbonite, but decides he can't let an entire nation get wiped out. So, the lot of you split up. Faye heads back to meet up with Bart and Billy to help defend Shavat, while Ellie and Satan head off to activate this mass driver and try and save the people from Solaris. Oh, and also, uh, Emerelda kind of shows up out of nowhere saying she'll help Ellie as well. Anyways, on Faye's side of things, he runs into Ramses almost immediately and proceeds to handily kick his butt. Thanks in large part to an upgrade he received from that old Yoda guy that allows him to tap into Id's power without actually awakening him. Meanwhile, on Sitanelli and Emerelda's side, they manage to reach the mass driver and release the nanomachines onto the planet. So the tiny bots are scattered across the world and they seem to work amazingly. The limiters are removed from every single lamb, finally freeing them from some of the constraints placed on them by Krellian. Oh, and by the way, I just wanted to make a correction on the last video. Uh, I said that the Gazelle Ministry placed these limiters on everyone 10,000 years ago, but it was actually Krellian who did it, and he only did it like 300 years ago, apparently. Eh, it's a little weird, but whatever. It was my mistake, and I'm sorry. Alright, anyways, after we done Ellie's aside, we go back to Faye. Apparently, off screen, they managed to save Shabbat, but Solaris had some sort of secret, super powerful sea urchin weapon? which is headed for Nissan. So, in that time, Bart is forced to enlist aid from an old enemy of his, Kislev, because apparently some other ancient Fatima weapon... The, God, how many of these ancient Fatima weapons are there? It, it turns out that there's a massive gear that was made by the Fatimas, and it's currently resting underneath Kislev. So Bart has to pilot it, Garin Logan style. You know, piloting a mech, piloting a submarine, which in turn is piloting this giant gear. Anyways, the Yggdrasil 4, as it's called, uh, no idea what happened to the Yggdrasil 3, by the way, defeats the giant sea urchin with ease, and another plot of Solaris is thwarted. 
But no time to celebrate because there is some bad news. There seems to have been a side effect to the nanomachines removing the limiters from everyone. Because, for whatever reason, thousands upon thousands of people across the globe begin to mutate at a ridiculously accelerated rate. It looks like somehow Krellian was able to predict what we were planning on doing and installed a countermeasure. In any event, the mutation itself is apparently exceedingly painful, but for whatever reason, there is one remedy to the pain, and that is untainted human blood. So, an epidemic began as mutated humans began to kill the non-mutated ones to get their precious blood and save them from their torment. Also, during this time, apparently Solaris opened up several research facilities that they apparently had scattered across the globe and began to take in as many mutants as they could. Outwardly, they claimed that they were working to cure the mutation, but it's freaking Solaris. We know that that's not what they're doing at all. All right, let's take another break here and answer a second question. So, I mentioned something in passing in the previous video, namely that humankind has only really existed on this planet for about 10,000 years or so. Well, that fact is actually foreshadowed rather heavily across the first disc, you actually find it out pretty early. The fact that despite a whole bunch of excavation is going on across all the nations, no one has ever been able to find traces of humankind before 10,000 years ago. And that's a bit odd for humans to just suddenly appear while leaving no traces of anything before that. Well, here's the reason for that. 10,000 years ago, a passenger ship was passing by the little unnamed rock we're currently living on. Aboard this ship was a secret superweapon called Deus. But it wasn't like a bomb or anything. No, it was a highly advanced artificial intelligence with outrageously destructive capabilities. Although they're a little bit vague on what exactly those capabilities are. Well, whatever the case, the ship ended up going down in a fiery blaze and crash landed on this planet. So Deus itself was trapped on a small, uninhabited planet in the middle of nowhere in some corner of the universe. It was also very badly damaged and didn't have anywhere near its original capabilities. So it not having much better to do created the first life. Beings. Like humans, but better, being capable of living tens of thousands of years. And among these first beings was their leader, the Emperor of Solaris, whose name was Cain, and his followers, the Gazelle Ministry. It also made a couple other important figures, but we'll come back to them later. For now, the main goal of Cain and the Gazelle Ministry was the resurrection of Deus, who they refer to as their god. And to do this, they needed to create a suitable body for him. And to do that, they needed humanity to reach a proper genetic level so that the flesh could contain Deus' consciousness. So, basically, Solaris has been selectively breeding humanity for the past 10,000 years. Culling the weak, strengthening the strong stock, until we finally achieve the perfect crop that they can harvest and turn into a body for their god. And well, this whole mutant thing that's going on right now is basically that harvest. At last, the Gazelle Ministry feels that humanity is evolved enough to create a suitable body for Deus, so they are using these facilities to basically collect mutants, turn them into like Play-Doh, and then just kind of goop them all together until a giant flesh ball is around, and then they can mold that flesh ball into a body of some sort for Deus' consciousness to be jammed inside. And after he's done that, he'll take the lot of them into the greater galaxy, where they will rule as the true gods of men that they are, and blah 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 blah. Cain is a bit of an exception to this though. He started off wanting to resurrect Deus, but over time he began to feel guilty for his actions and feel sorry for the poor lambs that they were mercilessly slaughtering over the years. As such, he has since abandoned his plan to reawaken Deus and has just been working to atone for his sins. Alright, hopefully all that makes sense. We are going back to the summary. Obviously there's still more questions, but we'll get to them. So your group breaks into one of these Solarian facilities with all the mutants and find a piece of mashed together human flesh that'll eventually become part of Deus' body. And it attacks you, so you're forced to defend yourself. After a bit, you defeat it with relative ease, but as it lays twitching on the floor, Ellie sees that there is still some humanity left within it. So she decides to help ease its pain before it passes on. And, with the help of Sitan's sword, draws a small amount of blood from her hand and feeds it to the beast.
The other mutants nearby are moved by Ellie's gesture, and you're able to liberate them from the Solaris facility and work to try and help cure them in a proper way. And what follows is presumably a campaign by your party to liberate as many mutants as possible from all the Solaris facilities. Eventually you bring them back to Nissan, and there you work with that Yoda guy to find a cure. During all of this, Ellie apparently becomes something of a hero, a symbol of hope for mutants that they will be able to be cured and spared the pain of their existence. And well, they begin to refer to her as the second coming of Mother Sophia, which, uh, I mean, she literally is, so, uh, good name, I guess. And it is at this point that Kane, the leader of Solaris, decides to do something for the first time in this entire freaking game. Basically, like I said before, Kane feels guilty about the whole treating humans like farm animals thing, so at last has decided to step in and try to atone for his sins. So, because he was the original life form, the ultimate human being as it were, he's able to exert his influence over the rest of the Gazelle Ministry and basically prevent them from doing anything. Good news for us at the very least, although your party doesn't even know that it's going on. Anyways, back on our side, your party starts looking for these things called anima relics, which are... uh... Look, the actual explanation for what the anima relics are is surprisingly complicated. They're like these ancient mystical relics left by Deus that are somehow connected with a bunch of important gears. It's honestly a lot to explain in an already very confusing story, and in the grand scheme of things, they aren't really that important even. So, simply put, I'm just going to skip over the broader reasons on why we have to get these things. If you really care that much, look it up. The simple version is, they're ancient powerful artifacts. We want them because they can power up our gears, and the Gazelle Ministry and Krellian want them because they can, for whatever reason, help reawaken Deus. Got it? So you head to this facility where the Anima Relic is, and you actually get to take part in a dungeon this time, surprisingly. So you know, you fight a bunch of monsters and explore a bunch of corridors and stuff, until eventually you make it to the end and are able to power up Billy's gear. As you begin to make your way out, though, you run into the elements who are blocking your way, and it is finally revealed why their gears look like animals. But sadly, despite their power up, they're still kind of a pushover and you continue on your way. In any event, at this point, for whatever reason, Ellie decides to split up with your group and head back to Nissan alone to help out with the mutant recovery effort. While there, we find out that her old crew has left Solaris and joined the good guys. You know, that group of guys from way back in the beginning of the game who attacked Bart's face. The, like, old punching bag of the week before Ramses decided to show up and take their spot. And, speaking of Ramses, he just so happens to attack Nissan at this very point. Which, rather perfectly, will segue us into our next question. So I've given Ramses a lot of flack over these past videos, and with good reason. He gets beaten like a cheap drum at just about every opportunity. But for what it is worth, I do actually find him to be a pretty effective character. Ramses wasn't so much born as he was created in a lab by Krillian. Now as to why Krillian created him, uh, again, I can't really go into details just yet. Sorry, I know I keep pushing stuff back, but there's a lot to establish before we can finally get answers. So for now, the simple version is Krellian, for reasons we'll get into later, needed a clone of Kane, and that's what Ramses is. However, as Ramses was growing in a big vat, Krellian learned of the existence of Fey, of Id, and the absurd power that he possessed. And well, he decided that Fey was more worthy of his time, would be a more suitable subject to fulfill his purposes. The important thing is Ramses was discarded because of this. Fey took his spot, and he was thrown in the trash and abandoned. 
But somehow he managed to survive, crawled his way out of the depths of oblivion, regained his life, entered high Solarian society, and ultimately became the commander of the Gepler forces watching over the surface dwellers. But despite his accomplishments, he never once received the recognition he felt he deserved. The people above him, especially the Gazelle Ministry, constantly refer to him as trash, the worthless dregs that came crawling back to them, so useless that it's not even worth getting rid of him. So, as you might expect, having a life like that, Ramses has developed something of an inferiority complex. And all that pent-up rage caused by the rejection of his very existence, he's decided to throw at Fey. After all, Fey was the reason he was abandoned in the first place. At first, it started off rather small. In the beginning, he didn't even know Fey was the reason he was discarded. But as he fought him more and more, and kept getting his ass handed to him on a platter again and again, his rage and inferiority began to grow. Until now, at this point, he is literally only one thought in his head. The defeat of Fey. In his mind, Fey's loss would finally validate his existence, finally prove that he was the superior being finally prove that he's not just a piece of trash. In any case, back to the events at hand. Ramses invades Nissan, obviously hunting for Fey. Ellie confronts him, claiming that Fey isn't here, leave these innocent people alone. But Ramses simply sees Ellie as a means of drawing Fey out. So he grasps Ellie with his mech and proceeds to try to kill her. However, Somehow, Ellie is able to free herself and overpower Ramses, and it's not really made clear how. And of course, this really starts to take a toll against Ramses' ego. Now, not only has he lost to Fey countless time, this guy with supposed mystic powers, but also this random girl who used to work for him, who isn't even riding a gear. So, Ramses slinks away dejected, where, once again, he is berated by the Gazelle Ministry, calling him the trash that he is. However, as he contemplates the worthlessness of his existence, Myung and Krellian tell him something. They say that there's one thing, one thing that only he can do. Anyways, back to the gang. Fei and Co. apparently found the last animal relic to power up Rico's gear and reunite with Ellie to go and find it. It's situated in this really super ancient ruin that's like believed to be the first remnants of civilization on this planet. So you make your way through there and defeat a bunch of monsters and do some really fucking arbitrary puzzles that require you to like press a very precise points on the map or something. But eventually it pays off and you find a power up for Rico's gear, much like you did with Billy. And similar to that dungeon as well, as you begin to make your leave, you find a familiar face blocking your exit. Oh dear. What's up, bro? Well, it looks like Hammer has been twisted by Krellian into a full-on weapon at this point. Your group are left with no options but to take him down. Well, Hammer, you didn't do a lot this game, but... You did take down Graf that one time for us, so for what it's worth, I'll miss you, bro. Anyways, it's at this point that Krellian and the Gazelle Ministry begin to enact their master plan, and we finally get an explanation as to the exact purpose Krellian created Ramses for. Simply put, Krellian created Ramses as a clone of Cain because the only one capable of killing the immortal Cain is Cain himself. And no, there's no real adequate explanation for why that is the case, you just gotta kinda roll with it. In any event, with Kane dead, the Gazelle Ministry are freed from his restraints and are able to go back to terrorizing the land. They use something known as the Geisha Key, which causes an ancient facility known as Mahanon, where the consciousness of Deus is being stored, to once again reappear, and it also causes the mass mutation that was starting to die down to return in full force. So, your party, of course, decide that you need to reach Mahanon before the Gazelle Ministry and Krellia do. But as you're preparing to depart the following day, uh, Faye and Ellie, uh, they... Yeah, we'll give them some alone time. 
In any event, after the uh, deed is done, so to say, Faye asks Ellie if she would stay behind while they go to Mahanon. While he knows that she's strong enough to protect herself, he wants a place to return to, somewhere that he can always call home, someone who he knows will always be there waiting for him. And while she puts up a bit of resistance, eventually Ellie agrees to stay behind and wait for him. And so Ellie leaves your party for the rest of the game. Wait, Ellie leaves your party for the rest of the game? But, but what about, but, what about Air Rods? Oh, I'm afraid spamming Air Rods is no longer a legitimate strategy. But, but, but it was so powerful. But, what, what am I supposed to do without it? I, I... Anyways, your party head off for Mahanon, where it turns out that, while the characters don't know it, we see that it's actually the remains of that spaceship that crashed here 10,000 years ago. And as you enter, you find, uh, Deus. Uh, yeah, this is the ultimate weapon, the god that Krellian and the Gazelle Ministry were trying to awaken, though it's not, like, fully recovered or anything. In any event, it still puts up something of a struggle in a, frankly, very annoying fight, but eventually you do defeat the thing and it fades away. So you head deeper into the ship to find out what the heck he's going on, and you find some old records that explain what exactly Deus is. Apparently, it's connected to this thing called the Zohar system, which is basically an infinite power supply. And that this infinite power supply is basically powering everything on the planet. All your gears, all your ether powers, stuff like that. But as you discover this, you are stopped by a large group of gears that descend from the sky, including Krellian and Graf of all people. And it looks like a lot of them have been looking very hard for this Zohar system, this supposedly limitless power supply. In any event, Graf proceeds to tap dance all over your party, I guess showing his full power for once. However, he is stopped short of killing you by Krellian, surprisingly. He tells Graf that he has a very special use for us. After all, he couldn't ask for better bait for the final piece of his plan, the one he's been working towards this entire time, the one he has always had his eyes on. Alright, good a time as any to answer some questions, and we're going to be answering two of them this time. The first one is... So, if you remember, Krillian was kicking around in Faye's past life 500 years ago, when Faye was called Lacan and Ellie had the title of Holy Mother Sophia. Well, during that time, he was a soldier of sorts who was won over to Ellie's side by her kind and caring nature. So, for much of his life, he acted as her right hand. While she was busy being the figurehead of her religion, he dealt with most of the admin that surrounded her. You know, strategy, setting up meetings with important figures, and he was the one that commissioned Lacan to paint Ellie's portrait. And, of course, like just about everyone in this game, he started to develop romantic feelings for Sophia, but decided that he shouldn't act upon them. Felt that simply being by her side was enough to satisfy him. Until, one day, he overheard Lacan and Sophia having a conversation, and began to realize that Sophia had feelings for Lacan. However, he didn't have a lot of time to contemplate how to deal with these feelings, because not long after his discovery, the war between Solaris and Shavat would come to an end with Sophia's sacrifice. You see, what happened was, Shavat and Solaris brokered a deal. Basically, Shavat would offer Sophia to them as, you know, a sacrificial lamb. In exchange, the war would finally come to an end. So, Krellian was left broken. The woman he loved, not only did she not love him back, but she was now dead, betrayed by the very people she fought to protect. So, Krellian's view on the world began to warp. He began to view love, the human concept of love that is, inferior. A feeble, fleeting series of emotions, no sturdier than a dried out old branch. The only true love, the only perfect love, was the love of God, the love of the great creator, the warm embracing love of all of life. And so, Krellian became obsessed with the idea of how imperfect humanity was and how much better it would be if all of them, including himself, 
a return to God's loving embrace. So, like the Gazelle Ministry, he set about trying to resurrect God. Delving into science and nanomachines, he figured out how to artificially extend his own life and started his work. However, unlike the Gazelle Ministry, Krellian has a slightly different perspective of God. They are simply pawns of Deus, seeing themselves as these superior beings who are part of him. But Krellian knows there's still one final piece missing. Something, or someone, that could make God truly complete. Someone who could provide that universal love that only a God could provide. Someone so perfect and pure that they were untainted by the filth of humanity. Someone he's been thinking of for over 500 years. Great, now that we know that, we can move on to the second question. Namely, So, Graf has been a real enigma this whole time. He's like, kinda working with Solaris, but also kinda doing his own thing. Like, what's his deal, you know? Well, simply put, Graf is Lacan, the past incarnation of Faye from 500 years ago. Why a past incarnation can exist when a new one does as well is a little odd, but it's kind of explained later on. In any event, we already know what happened to Lacan initially. He painted Sophia, fell in love with her, the two of them started to realize their feelings for one another, but then she died in a blaze of fire and scrap metal. So, Lacan was left in much a similar situation as Krellian, grieving for the loss of his loved one. However, while Krellian went on a bit of an odd turn, basically vowing one day to resurrect God, Lacan had almost the exact opposite epiphany. He thought, what kind of God would let a person like Sophia die like that? So, he came out with the philosophy of wanting to find power. Power enough to never feel as powerless as he did when he was unable to save Sophia. Power enough to seek vengeance against those that did this to her. Power enough to destroy the very god that allowed all of this to happen in the first place. So, that's what Lacan did. He basically set off into the world to search for power and, well, he found it. What exactly that power is we'll get into later, but the important thing is he found a way to gain the unlimited, unstoppable power he desired. But there was a problem, because Lacan is only human. No matter how much power he gained over the course of his lifetime, it was still a lifetime. Something with a finite end that would prevent him from ever truly achieving his goals. And unlike Krellian, Lacan didn't have access to those life-enhancing nanomachines. So, What's a power-hungry man to do? Well, simply put, he developed a technique that allowed him to transplant his consciousness out of his body and take over another person's. And no, the game doesn't give us an explanation of how or why he can do this, he just can. So that's who Graf truly is. The consciousness of Lacan bouncing from body to body, persisting in this world for over 500 years. But his search may finally be coming to an end because he may, at last, have found the perfect vessel to contain the power he found. A vessel so very similar to the one he had inhabited back in the beginning. So yeah, Krellian and Graf are actually rather similar when it comes down to it. Both of them are seeking vengeance for the same girl they fell in love with, and both see your party as the final pieces necessary to complete their master plan. Krellian needs Ellie, and Graf needs Faye. So back to the plot at hand. Krellian's trap is a success. Ellie, upon hearing that her friends have been captured, suits up in her gear and heads off to meet with Krellian. There she finds an imposing scene. All of her friends' gears crucified. Maria, sit at Faye. <laughs> oh my god, that took all the tension out of the scene. Fucking choo-choo. <sighs> Anyways, where was I? Alright, we're all being held prisoner, and Krellian tells Ellie that if she wants them free, she needs to demonstrate her power by defeating his two lackeys. And she is forced to fight a pair of gears, one I don't think we've ever seen before, and one being that vague guy we saw for like 10 seconds when we fought Emerelda. Anyways, Ellie barely manages to defeat the two of them, but falls unconscious from the effort. 
And, well, Krellian is surprisingly true to his word. He does let the rest of your party go upon her victory, but of course he does take Ellie with him. So your group are badly beaten, but it's not over yet. After Faye does a bit of moping and Wise Man shows up for some reason to talk some sense into him, you get ready to go and rescue Ellie. I mean, Krellian and Graf beat you into the ground without barely any effort before, but it's not like you can just sit back and do nothing. Meanwhile, on Krellian's side, he sets about prepping for the final stages of his plan to awaken God. But before he does that, he has one final thing to take care of. The Gazelle Ministry have outlived their usefulness. Now that all the pieces are in place, he has no need for them anymore. He just needed their help to mutate all the population. So he simply shuts them off. And one by one, the floating sphere of Darth Sidious heads erased from existence. Back to our party as we set off to find Krellian and rescue Ellie. But before you can reach Krellian, you're stopped by... <sighs> Ramses again. Despite the fact that Krellian was just using him to kill Kane, despite the fact that the Gazelle Ministry are dead, despite the fact that his subordinates, the Elements, are begging him to see reason, he still believes that the only way to redeem himself is to defeat Faye. So, for the last time, he faces you in battle. And I hate to say it, but once again, he's a total pushover. Uh, you gotta feel bad for the guy. I, I almost want to let him win. But of course you don't, and you push past the unconscious Ramses in order to stop Krellian and save Ellie. And sure enough, it's not long before you find him standing next to a crucified Ellie. And Myong. Alright, question time, people, and this time it's a doozy of a one, so let's get it on. Out of all the characters in this game, Myung is by far the most mysterious. While she's always been seen as a servant of Ramses, we've also seen that she has powers far beyond what she outwardly shows. She's also the only character ever shown to be able to speak on equal footing with both Krellian and Graf. While I wouldn't say the two exactly respect her or anything, they certainly seem to acknowledge her as an inevitable part of everything they do. So what is her deal? Well, that is a bit of a long story, and it ties back in with Faye and Ellie's past, as well as the past of the entire world. So, remember way back in the start of this video, when I was talking about Faye and Ellie's past lives, I briefly mentioned that there was one important past life that happened about 10,000 years ago. Well, during that time was the original incarnations of Faye and Ellie. At the time, Faye was a young child named Abel, and he was aboard the ship that was carrying Deus. While aboard that ship, he got separated from his mother, and like any child would, he began to search for her. And in his search, he happened upon the core of Deus, the section where the Zohar system kept its power running. And there, Deus, sensing the boy's desire to find his mother, created a woman. A woman with motherly features. Whatever that means. In any event, this woman was sort of a part of Deus. But also, kind of, Myung? Uh, you'll see in a second. In any case, soon after the woman's creation, the ship carrying all of them went out of control and crash landed on the planet. So, the woman began what would be a plan 10,000 years in the making. A plan to restore Deus. And to do that, she needed people. So, she became the mother of humanity and created the first life on this planet. Namely, Cain and the Gazelle Ministry, the first humans. However, after that, she also created two more women. Two women that were sort of halves of her. They were basically going to be the Watchers of Humanity and be two of the main keys that would ultimately resurrect Deus. The first was Ellie, the original incarnation of Ellie. She received much of the motherly side of things, basically what Abel had been searching for kindness, compassion, caring, yada yada, and was made basically to both watch over humanity as it grew to a suitable state, and be the final necessary piece to complete Deus' resurrection. 
the second was Mial, the first incarnation of Mial. She was given far less human emotions, and instead was given the task of being an overseer, the one who would guide humanity's evolution in the right direction, and ensure that Deus' resurrection would actually be carried out by carrying out all the pieces that would lead to it. And well, she has a number of strange properties about her. You see, unlike Kane, she's not exactly immortal, at least not in the same sense. She can die quite easily, and it's not like she can't age either. She'll die the same age as any old human would. Instead, because she was the original creator of humanity, a little, tiny, insignificant bit of her resides within every single human female on the planet. So, while she can only reside in one body at a time, if her body were to fall, she would simply begin to inhabit another. So, while she herself is technically not immortal, as long as a single other woman exists somewhere on the planet, she cannot truly die. However, it does seem to come with the caveat that she is incapable of killing herself or something. Anyways, over the centuries since her birth, she has worked tirelessly towards her one goal, the resurrection of Deus. Unlike Ellie, who got to forget her original mission and got to live out multiple different lives whenever she was reborn, Myung was solely focused on her task. She worked with any number of influential people over the years. She worked with Kane and Solaris when it was first formed. She was the one who convinced Kim to create Amarelda and tried to use her, which is what forced Kim to seal himself away from the outside world. And, more recently, she worked hand in hand with the Gazelle Ministry to resurrect their god in the final stages of their plan. And, when it became apparent that Krellian was going to be more up to the job than the Gazelle Ministry was, she was more than happy to abandon them and join Krellian instead. Every single part of her long string of rebirths has been exclusively aimed at this one goal. And now, at last, after 10,000 long years, she's finally about to achieve it. Okay, back to the plot at hand. Krellian and Myung now have Ellie and are mere moments away from reawakening Deus. However, after explaining the futility of your group's efforts to stop them, a surprising visitor interrupts the scene. It is Ramses. He walks up to Krellian and Myung and asks them, what was his purpose? Why did they create him? What point did his life have? Myung turns slowly to Ramses. The only point you ever had, the only reason you were ever created, was to kill Cain. As powerful as I am, I still lack the means to kill him. Only a copy could possess those traits that could possibly fell him. So we created you for that purpose. Then, later on, when we wanted to control you, we gave you a simple narrow drive to egg you on. The resentment of Faye. With that, we could get you to do our bidding with barely any effort. And that's all there is. That was your sole reason for existence. And now that it's complete, you're just little more than trash. And so Myung begins to laugh at Ramses, Krelly joining in, the two mocking such a pathetic excuse for a being. Not even a real human being, just a mass of DNA created in a lab. Just another useless pawn that they used and are now throwing away. Just a... Having finally had enough, Ramses drives his blade into Myung's chest with as much force as he can. And as her eyes close, she thanks Ramses for doing what she believed he could do. With Myung dead, Ramses then turns his blade on Krellian, striking him down with ease. The rest of your party just kind of look on in disbelief for a moment, but eventually move on to pull down Ellie from her cross. Yes, the final step to awakening Deus, the final piece needed to fully awaken him, was 
the death of Mion. In killing her, Ramses gave her the ability to travel to a new host. The perfect host, the only host that would reunite her as the original Mion that she once was. The body of Ellie. And at last, for the first time in 10,000 years, the two halves of Deus' creation are made whole, and the entity that many call God is at last reawakened. Having her power back, Myung and Krellian, who was apparently only pretending to be injured by Francis' sword, I guess, depart to finish off Deus' true goal. Now that it's resurrected, it wants to get off this rock and return to the stars. And to do that, it will need the Zohar system, that infinite power supply that's powering everything on this planet. So, the two of them leave. And despite Faye crying out to Ellie, the one he knows, the one he loves to return to him, she simply says goodbye and vanishes. After this, apparently some time passes. Deus and Krellian create an arc of sorts called the Merkava that they travel around on, seeking the Zohar system. Meanwhile, Faye apparently ditches your party to chase after Ellie without them. And when your party finally does manage to catch up with him, for some reason he's in a state of stasis. Not really awake or asleep, just kind of out of commission. Anyways, your group bring him back to Shabbat, and well, an old fear starts to well up within them. What if Id takes advantage of Faye being unconscious and decides to show up once again? So, they do what they threatened to do before and decide to freeze Faye in Carbonite. Only for Id to almost immediately break free of his prison. Also, Dan's here for some reason. Anyways, Id, rather than destroying everything like he usually does, instead makes a beeline for the Zohar system, which he apparently knew the location of. Okay, so we are getting near the end here, but there are still a couple more lingering questions. So here we go. Well, to answer that, we have to go back a couple years. Back to when Faye was just a wee lad. When Faye was a child, he had a pretty happy life. Nothing too extravagant, but he had a loving mother, a hardworking father, and a wholesome home life. Oh, by the way, wise man is Faye's father. He lied to you and said he wasn't, but he actually was. Just a heads up, his name's Khan, by the way. Anyways, idyllic life, simple but happy. However, one day, for some reason, Faye's mother's expression began to change. The love and care that she used to show seemed to drain from her eyes. Whenever her father was around, she acted like she always had, but as soon as he left, every day he went to work, an emptiness seemed to overcome her. And well, now knowing what we know, it's pretty easy to figure out what happened. Faye's mother was randomly replaced by a new incarnation of Mion. In any event, Myong took a great interest in Faye. She saw a potential in him that would ultimately lead towards her own goals. So, whenever Faye's father went to work, she began to perform experiments. She would subject Faye to any number of extreme stimuli, pain, grief, you name it, and record how they would draw out his latent powers. She would send people into contact with Faye as she invoked his powers, which would cause those people to disintegrate. Faye was powerless to stop any of it. He tried in vain to suppress the abilities within him, but to no avail. People around him would constantly die. He tried to tell his father of the horrible things his mother was doing, but his father simply thought he was being a foolish child, that he wasn't making any sense. Time and time again, Faye was forced to watch as more and more people were destroyed by his own power, as his own mother pushed him to do these things terrible experiments. Faye was pushed and pushed and pushed again, until he was teetering on the very brink of madness by the horrors he was forced to bear witness to. Till at last, his young mind couldn't take it anymore. After weeks of torment, the young Faye was finally able to find a way to relieve his pain. He created a persona, a new personality within himself. One to absorb all the pain and negative emotions he was being subjected to. One to be there and take his place whenever something bad happened to him. Meanwhile, the real Faye would be able to retreat back deep, deep within the confines of Faye's subconscious. And there, just surround himself with the few happy memories he had. 
And there, that personality, the true personality, stayed. Only coming out when the coast was clear, when his mother wasn't forcing him into these horrible experiments. So, as you can imagine, Id began to resent the world. There was nothing of value here. The happy memories of this past weren't given to him. They were selfishly hoarded by the true Fae. The only experiences he had in life were pain and suffering. The only thing he ever seemed able to do was destroy everything around him. The only thing the world had to offer him was suffering. And then, a strange entity came into the picture. Graf, someone who sought the powers Fae had, someone who seeked to use that power to destroy everything. At this point, Fae's father was finally able to see what he'd been missing, that his child's pleas for help were genuine. But it was too late. He was powerless to stop Graf. He fought valiantly to protect his son from him, but it was no use. At the sight of their father falling to the stranger, at the sight of his mother blankly looking on, still as cold and distant as always, Faye lost control, and his surge of energy wiped out everything around him. His father was blown away, his house was reduced to rubble, and his mother was killed by his own power. Enough! shouts Faye, the Faye we know. This can't be all there is, all this suffering. This can't be the only part of our existence. Oh, but don't you see? Suffering is our existence. And now, at last, with the power from the Zohar system, we can finally share that suffering with the rest of the world. When we wipe out every single living thing on this godforsaken planet. No, I refuse to believe it. There's more to life than just pain. Faye turns to the original Fay. The coward will call him just to keep things simple. I know that you know that there's more to us than just suffering. You have to show Id what you've been keeping from him. No! I, I refuse to show the one who killed my mother anything. Ha! You're one to talk. You're just as guilty of killing mother as I am. No, 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 no. You did it. You, you couldn't stand what she put you through, so you killed her. It's, it's all your fault. Enough! You can't keep hiding like this. All of us, each and every one of us, killed Mother. Because at the end of the day, we aren't separate entities. We are all part of Fae. We need to become one being, and to do that, we need to stop hiding from Id. Stop pushing all your blame onto him. You need to accept him as a part of it yourself, and at last show him what you've been hiding from him all along. Don't you see it? Life isn't just suffering. In the end, our mother sacrificed everything. And she saved us. She saved you. Because in the end, she loved you. What? What? No, no, that that can't be true. This, this has to be an illusion or something created by that coward to- Come now, Ed. We know that isn't the case. You have to see that this is reality. I- I, I always thought that our power was only capable of destruction. That, that the only way I could possibly connect with anyone was death. Well, it, any power has ramifications to it. But I truly believe that our power can save people. Just like our mother was able to overcome me all. We too can overcome our limitations and save people. Save Ellie. If we work together, we can do anything. All right. 
You already know what I've done. The atrocities I've committed. Take my memories. Figure out what to do with all of this. Together, we can all become Fae. And it is at this moment, the moment when the three Fae's finally unite, when Fae is finally one complete being, that he, uh, meets God. Okay, we have come a long way to get here, but good news. If you've managed to hang in over the course of this wild, wild ride, we have finally reached the final answer to the final question. So here it is. Over the course of this game, we've learned a whole lot about our ponytailed protagonist. He's a big dumb goof who gets easily discouraged, but can generally be relied upon to do the right thing when push comes to shove. He's done the horizontal tango with a red-headed hottie, befriended a disposed monarch, earned the begrudging respect of a prison kingpin, and been propositioned by a teddy bear. I guess it's safe to say he's been around. On top of that, he has a number of past lives, one where he was dating the Pope, one where he created a little girl version of the T-1000, and one where he was the spark that caused life to literally be created on an otherwise uninhabited planet. But why the hell is that? Why does a child meeting a living supercomputer cause this? Right. So, I've been dreading talking about this because this is far and away the most complicated part of the story going on here, and I'm still not 100% I've got all my facts straight. I'm like 90% sure I've got most of it, but I might have gotten a few things mixed up. Whatever, I'll try my best. So first, Deus was created not by humans, but by some ancient super advanced alien race. The race itself isn't important. What is important is the fact that Deus is sort of made up of parts that are somewhat incomprehensible to a normal human being. Anyways, they created Deus to be the ultimate weapon. And the reason they created it was to take advantage of their other invention, the Zohar system. After all, what better way to make use of infinite power than a galaxy destroying super AI? So, when young Abel came into contact with the Zohar system, for whatever reason, kind of beyond human comprehension, it caused a wave. Not like a physical wave per se, but a wave into time itself. A wave into the fourth dimension. So, this wave traveled through time and space until suddenly it came into contact with an entity. God? Maybe, but it calls itself the wave existence. And it is some fourth dimensional being far beyond our mortal comprehension. The thing that Faye is talking to is really just Faye's perception of what God would look like, all theoretical existence and stuff like that. In any event, when the wave came into contact with this entity, it kind of dragged it back with it. And the entity ended up getting sucked inside the Zohar system, and there it found itself trapped, for whatever reason, unable to leave the system by its own means. So, it set about a plan. A plan to free itself from the Zohar system and return to its own reality. And this plan is the part that I'm not 100% sure on, so bear with me. So, as far as I can tell, the Wave Existence plan was it needed to destroy the Zohar system, its prison. But to do that, it needed Deus to be reconstructed, because at this point the ship had crash-landed and Deus was critically damaged. So, when Deus created Miong, and then Miong split into the lesser Miong and Ellie, the Wave Existence put its personality inside of Ellie. That personality being, uh... Motherly? Because the uh, first thing it came into contact with in our dimension was Abel, who was looking for his mother. And because it doesn't fully comprehend us the same way we can't comprehend it, the wave existence adopted that personality. Uh, I don't know. That's just kind of the best way I can put it. Uh, sorry if that doesn't make any sense. In any event, now events were in motion to resurrect Deus. On the other side of things, the wave existence put its power inside of young Abel, the only survivor of the shipwreck. And that power was the ability to destroy the Zohar system from the outside. But he wouldn't be able to use that power until Deus was complete once more, which would finally expose the Zohar system and finally allow him to be free. So the wave existence made it so that Faye and Ellie would constantly be reborn time and again until Deus was finally complete and his plan would finally pay off. Alright, if you didn't follow any of that, I don't 
blame you. I just, here's the simple version as far as I can tell. God's plan is nearing its end and Faye is the final step of that plan. Now the daze is complete, Faye needs to go and destroy it, which in turn will destroy the Zohar system, which will destroy the prism that is keeping the wave existence in place, which will allow it to return to its fourth dimension and inevitably save the day, I guess. In any event, that's it. That's the big answer to why everything is going on as it is. So, at last, we can return to the summary as we enter the final stages of the game. Faye wakes up understanding everything. The three personalities within him have finally reunited and he's received his mission from God. As he awakens, we find that while he was working on that stuff out in his head, his friends, as well as his father, had been in a heated battle with Id fighting desperately to prevent him from destroying the entire planet. But at last, Faye is calm, and Id is no more, or at least a part of him. So, for the first time in many years, Faye gets to finally reunite with his father, both of them truly complete at last. Psych! Actually, Faye's father was Graf! <sighs> okay. So remember in that flashback when we saw that Graf showed up when Faye's power went berserk? Well, in that chaos, it seems that he used his weird body-swapping power that he learned back when he was Lacan to take over Faye's father, Khan's body. Although, he was never able to get complete control of it, and occasionally Khan was able to wrestle back control of his body from Graf, which in-game was whenever we ran into him when he was Wise Man. So basically, in case you're not keeping track of all these names being thrown out here, Graf slash Lacan is inhabiting Khan slash Wise Man's body. In any event, Graf ain't losing control of his body now, because at last, Faye has achieved the true power he was seeking. The power Graf needed to get his revenge. And he'll be taking that body back for himself, thank you very much. But, much to Graf's surprise, Faye's able to pull, uh, this maneuver, and return to his gear. Which means it's time for a badass gear battle. Graf is certainly no pushover. He's been training for hundreds of years, access the power of the Zohar system, surpassed his own mortality. But Faye isn't the Faye he once was. A resolve that wasn't there before has awoken within him. A drive to save the planet, to save his friend, to save the woman he loves. And so, after a heated battle, at last, the mighty Graf, Faye's own path life Lacan, is defeated once and for all. Okay, we've made it to the end of the game. Just one dungeon stands in our way before we can have our last face-off with Deus. But before we do that, there is one thing I'd like to do, because it is at this point, for the first time in the second disc, we get to actually traverse the world map. And well, there's one special little thing I want to share with you all before we go. That's right, I'm talking about Big Joe, baby! Oh, also, Emerald and Faye get to see, like, a little window into Kim's past, and, like, the whole thing is so emotional for Emerald that she grows as a person, both metaphorically and literally. Okay, with that out of the way, it's finally time. Finally time to traverse Deus' home, the Merkava, put a stop to that artificial monstrosity, and finally, save Ellie.
So, long, long last, the weapon known as Deus is defeated. With that, Faye is finally able to destroy the Zohar system, freeing the wave existence from its long prison at last. However, it looks like we have a bit of a problem on our hands. It seems that freeing a fourth dimensional being, or whatever the wave existence is, has had some unforeseen consequences. To make matters worse, since the Zohar system was the thing powering all of our gears, it being destroyed means that technically none of your gears can move. But that is when a miracle begins to occur. The anomaly, centered around the top of Deus, begins to lift off. It seems like Deus is using the last of its dwindling power to push the energy spike away from this planet. Ellie, it, it has to be Ellie. She's saving humanity by sacrificing herself once again. But this time, Dei isn't going to let her do that. He isn't going to make the same mistake Lacan did. Thanks to having made contact with a wave existence, Faye's gear is the only one with any power left. He's the only one capable of saving Ellie. With a short nod, he says farewell to the rest of his friends and heads off to save the love of his life. Reminded me of when I met the wave existence, so uh, I, I guess like inside my head or something. <gasps> Ellie, don't, don't worry, I'm gonna get you out of here soon. <laughs> what makes you so sure she's willing to leave? Whoa, uh, wait, wait, that voice. Uh, uh, Krellian? Greetings, Lakar. Look at the beauty of this place, the majesty of the wave surrounds us. It's more beautiful than I could have possibly imagined, don't you agree? Yeah, that that may be for you, but as for me, I'm leaving as soon as I can, and I'm taking Ellie with me. Oh? <laughs> you think you're saving her, do you? Can't you see, Lacan? Here is perfection. Here we are one with God. Can you not feel it? It's all-encompassing love and warmth. Listen, Krellian, I know you were hurt in the past, but you can't just leave your humanity behind like this. And why can't I? Humanity is nothing but a blight, an imperfection, an insignificant byproduct created by waves. Even if they were to create something of worth, man's pathetic squabbling nature would cause it to either be misused or destroyed. Humanity is better off leaving themselves behind and surrendering themselves to God. The fate of mankind cannot be decided by your will alone, Corellian. People have the right to their own destiny. Oh, and what if I were to tell you that the very notion of free will was nothing more than an illusion? What appears to be choice is really just a predetermined line of events set in motion by the waves eons ago. Humanity would be better off if they cast aside their imperfection and became as I have, part of God, part of the indelible will of the universe. <sighs> you know, you're right about one thing, Krellian. Mankind is imperfect. We may squabble amongst ourselves, hurting and destroying others at times, but... At the same time, that imperfection is what makes us beautiful. It is because of that imperfection that we are forced to rely on one another, to gain strength from others. And it is that part of ourselves that truly makes us beautiful. I look at Ellie here and I know exactly what she is thinking, because I can feel her thoughts and emotions inside of me like they were my very own. I know that she's scared. I know that she's determined to save as many people as she can. But more than anything, I know she wants to save you, Krellian. She wants to prove to you that humanity isn't worth giving up on. And with all of my heart, 
I agree with her. Krellian, you are human. Hmm, if that's how you see it, then show me. Prove to me how powerful this so-called humanity you hold so dear really is. Let's return to our planet. That light... It's the point of contact with our world. But the dimensional shift has already begun. Will we make it in time? Can you run? If we're together, I can. time. This place is about to be destroyed. Now there is no more God. This is no longer their planet. This is your home planet that you are now standing on. Krellian, you aren't going, are you? No. Since that time, I have stopped being human. I've committed so many sins that any attempt at living like a human is impossible. The only one who could have forgiven me was God. That's not true. I know they would understand. There's still plenty of time to atone for your sins. You of all people could do it. Always the peacemaker, eh, Lacan? Perhaps that's what it means to be human. But regardless, I cannot go. It's something I've already decided. I go to walk with God. 
even if there's no place left for me upon my return. I must go now. Krillian! Actually... I envy you too. What happened? Waves from the explosion disrupted the ionosphere, making it impossible to get a visual. They were probably caught up in the explosion. That's a lie! <laughs> He'll come back. He promised us he would. I know it. Well, what do you know? It's not every day you see the stupidest thing you've ever seen. <laughs>